each and every one of us. We are in a war, but it's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. But I want to give you encouragement today that we have the victory because we belong to Christ. If you don't belong to Christ, I highly recommend that you find relationship in Him because the Bible says if you're not for Him, then you're against Him. By default, if you are not living for God, you're living against God. You might say, Pastor, but I'm a good person. I don't care. <laughs> the Word says it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It's, it's hopeless to, to strive and to put your life deposits into being a good person. Those, that's great, but it's not going to get you eternal hope and salvation with God, the master and the ruler and creator of it all. Today, we're going to launch a series that will absolutely change your life because we are in a battle, and God has given us the victory. And today, we're going to talk about your attacker and his strategies. Today we're going to unpack a little bit uh, who this is that we're in war against and what the enemy's strategy really is. But before I do that, I want you to recognize and realize that if you found Christ in your life, that when you accepted him, invited him to live with you, that, that you became a brand new creation. The Bible says that all the old things of life passed away and behold, all things become new, brand new new. How many of you guys are excited about the fact that, that, when, that when you come to Christ, everything in life becomes brand new. He gives you a brand new start. Amen? Aren't you glad for second chances? Good, because I needed a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and two millionth chance because of all the times, all the times that I fell short in my relationship with God. But He is so, so very quick to forgive us and wipe our slate clean and allow us to start all over again. I want to, before we get into who this enemy is and what his attack is all about, I want to ask you a question. If somebody were to try to break into your home, would you just sit there? Would you just allow them to break into your home and to kill you, to kill your children, to steal your belongings, to destroy you? Would you literally let somebody come in to your house and declare battle against you and your family. And if they did, what would you do? What would your response be? How, how would you react to that? Would you just, men, would you just lie there in bed? Would you just literally lie there knowing that the enemy was, was crawling through one of your windows after your children or after your possessions or wanted to harm your wife? Would you just lay there and let it happen? I hope the answer is a resounding no. But what's happening each and every day is that there is an enemy. And he is attacking our homes. He is attacking our children. Men, he is attacking your wives. And he's attacking you. Because if you belong to God, he not only hates God, he hates you. And he's going to do anything and everything he can within his power to bring you down and make sure that you don't experience heaven as your home. So who am I talking about? His name obviously is Satan. Better known, though, in heaven as Lucifer, where he began as the most beautiful angel in all of creation. He was second in command, as far as we know, over all of heaven. And he was not only beautiful, but scholars think, see, he was the worship leader in heaven. And scholars think that his rib cages were like pipe organs. So when he spoke, that it was like a massive choir and an orchestra just with the syllable of one word. And he was covered and just, he was just radiating all of this beauty and all of this wonder. But remember that he was created by God. But what happened was he came to a place where he became so full of himself and so arrogant, so caught up in his beauty and in his abilities and in his influence that he had in all of heaven that he began to think of himself as being better and higher than God. And he even told God all about it in this passage that we see in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Some of you may have read it. I call it the five I wills. This is Satan telling God the five things that he's going to do because he thinks so highly of himself. But God is speaking to him, and he's, he's reminding Satan of what he has said. At this time, he, he's Lucifer, but God is reminding him of what he has said, notice, in his own heart. He didn't even say it with his mouth, but he had this thought, and God calls him on it. He says, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend 
to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. That was the first I will. The second is this. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. The third, I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, God says you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. And so we see God cursed him and he threw him down changed his life dramatically, took away his calling, took away his title, even transformed him from the beautiful angel he was to something that was wicked and despicable and detestable, something you wouldn't even want to look at even for a moment. But in that, at that time when he was thrown down, he had so much influence as a leader in heaven because of his title, because of who he was, he was able to influence a third of the angels of heaven, and they too were cast out with him. I want to give just a few titles that he holds now as an unemployed cherub. We call him the prince of the prince of the air in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. In Revelations 12 and 10 we call him an accuser because he spends day and night accusing you and me of the sins that we've committed but he has a hard time wrapping his, his mind around the fact that God has totally and completely wiped our sins away and forgiven us. But he wants to have a, a hearing, a, a court case about you and me constantly, never ending. He's always accusing us of our sins. He's always pointing his finger at us, trying to remind us of what we've done. He is the tempter. His job, and you're going to find out a little bit more. In, more intricately in, into the breakdown of how it, out, how it all works, but part of his, his job and the job of his army is to bring temptation to our lives so that we will stumble and so we will fall. He's known as the deceiver in Revelations 20, 1 through 3, and he is best known as a liar and the father of all lies, and that's John 8 and 44. Think about all the times that the enemy plants thoughts in your mind that is totally, completely opposite of the truth. Think about how many times he causes you to ask questions when you know the answer yourself. It started back in the garden and he has not quit since. He told Adam and Eve, will you surely die? Did God really say that you would die if you eat of this fruit? You won't die. You'll just become like God, and he doesn't want you to become like him. He's a deceiver, and he's a liar. He's the father of all lies. He causes you to ask yourself questions when you know what the answer is. He says, do you really need to go to church today? Wouldn't you rather sleep in? Wouldn't you rather be out on the lake? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you rather do something else? Do you really need to go to church, period? I mean, why do you need to go? Why do you need to really have friends that go to church? They're just, you know, they're, they're, they're just crazy. They're, they're, they're lunatics, and they carry their Bibles everywhere, and they're, they're nuts and they're always believing God for this and believing God for that. They've lost their mind. Why would you do that? And why would you tithe? Why would you give 10% of your income to God? That's yours. That doesn't belong to God. You've worked really hard by the, the sweat and, and the blood and the tears of, of your work day in and day out. You've earned that. Why would you give that to God? He asks and causes you to ask all of these questions when we know what the answer is. We know that if we want to fail, if we want to fall short from a vibrant, life-changing relationship with God, we have to be in God's house every time the doors are open. I don't know about you. Maybe you're way stronger and more mature than I am, but I have to be in God's house every single time the doors are open. I refuse in my life not to pay my tithe because I know that 100%, just like Kathy so beautifully said, belongs to God anyway. And he commands me in his word to give him a tenth of the increase to give back to him. Why? To show my devotion and my dedication to him and to his kingdom. And he can use those resources to further his kingdom and help more people come to Christ. Why would I want to surround myself with godly people? Because I know that iron sharpens iron. And so a person sharpens the countenance of their friend. I know that I have to have godly in Influences. I know that I have to surround myself with people who are going to pull me up and not pull me down. I know that I've got to surround myself with the right things so I can be in right position with God. Amen. So if you kind of understand now who the attacker is, we're going to go a little bit deeper into understanding what his strategy is. But our text for this series is going to come from Ephesians chapter 6. So if you have your word today or a smartphone, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read verses 10 through 12, and it says this. 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. First of all, just pause for just a minute. We're going to get into that in the coming weeks. But what you need to understand is that this battle that you're in, once you've surrendered and you understand you are created by God, okay, just like Lucifer, we are also created by God. When we begin to realize that God has a plan, Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, my plans for you are good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. He sent his own son, Jesus Christ, into this world to give his life so that you and I might have our sins forgiven and live. When we realize that and we come into that relationship with Jesus Christ, then we have to know that it is not by our own power that we do anything in this life from that point forward. It's like when you say, I do in marriage, no longer do you do anything by yourself any longer. Every decision that you make, everything that goes forward, you do together. When you say, I do to Jesus Christ in a relationship with him, everything from that moment forward, you do together. So this scripture makes it so clear to us that we are to be strong, not in ourself, not in our own ability, not in our own knowledge, not in our own wisdom, but in who? In the power of his might that is in God's. It goes on to say, so put on the whole armor of God. As we go through this series, we're going to go through the coolest armor you've ever seen in your life. But that's not today. We're going to save that for a couple weeks. But it goes on. That you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What in the world is wiles? Wiles literally means his strategies, his tactics, or his schemes. You have to understand that he hates you because you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Now, if you haven't done that, you're on his side. So you're all good. You're going to be miserable because you don't have the peace in your life because you don't have the Prince of Peace. But you're good as far as the war goes, okay? I don't want that because I want to have my hope in heaven. But if you are on God's side, then you know that you're going to have strategic strategies against you every single day. Go on to verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This word wrestle means to struggle. How many of you guys have ever struggled with anything before? All of us have. There's sayings in life that we have struggled. You understand what it's like? It's like tug of war. If you've ever played tug of war, I, I remember seeing people do it with the mud pit. And you are literally struggling to keep yourself from falling in that pit. That's literally the picture here of wrestling. It's a struggle. It says, we do not wrestle or struggle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Notice how many times the word against is used in that one verse. Five times. It's pretty important. What we need to begin to understand is, in this life, we are flesh and blood, okay? So the things that the enemy begins to use against us are the very people that are in our life, okay? He uses people and circumstances and situations. And so oftentimes, when things start to go wrong, Kathy shared an awesome testimony of multiple things that have gone wrong in her life and in her family's life. And I can only imagine, if you were there, when the windshield breaks on the tractor or your child shoots a golf ball through the window. I remember when I was growing up at home, my brothers, um, they liked to golf. And this wasn't children. These were big people, okay? We're talking teenagers, and some of them might have been adults. And I remember um, Stan was out in the garden, and Mom and Dad have a huge garden, and it was pointing towards the house, and he had a golf ball out there. And Dad was over by the tractor. We, we live on a ranch to a farm. And dad yells and he's like, hey, don't be playing golf in the yard. You might break a window. And Stan was probably way close to adulthood. I'm not sure how old he was. And he was like, no, it's all right. It's fine. I know, know what I'm doing. And he hits the ball and Four. right through my mom's kitchen window. I mean, immediately. It wasn't like he even made one good shot. It was right through the window. And his mouth just like dropped open as dad stood back and said, I told you so. Do you know that my dad didn't fix that window for like 15 years? He just replaced that window like two years ago. And forever we were like, yeah, that was all because, that was all because you didn't listen. But you know what? Sometimes the enemy will use those crazy situations. We could have had World War III at our house that day. 
all because a little window got broken. Do you know what I'm saying? You can begin to fight. I can just imagine in some people's homes that a big old fight would have broke out because somebody broke a window. I remember when our boys were playing right out here in our, our beautiful, luxurious minivan, was sitting over there in the parking lot. And our boys were Is having... Is that the van you promised we would never own? Yes. Yeah. I never wanted one. Never, I never was going to drive one, but I had one. And our boys were having this um, snowball fight. Well, Ty didn't realize that sometimes in the snow, rocks could be under the snow that was packed, right? So my genius child, he picks up this awesome snowball and he packs it hard and he wings it right at his brother's head. Yeah, at AJ's and face. I yeah. don't know what would have been worse, AJ's head or my window, but AJ moved and it crashes out a giant window on the side of the minivan. Now, in that moment, Brad and I happen to be really close in that moment. And I'm thinking, oh no, we have a broken window. And Brad is chasing my son. Thinking and of I'm ways thinking, I can kill him. Wait a second, my son's gonna die as he's running around the yard going, Tyler, come here. And well, if you'd have drove by, you'd the window the was tinted. It it had defrost like lining in it so that it, he, it had a heated very glass. Cool window. So it was a very awesome window. And it was very expensive. Yeah. Well, the point that day is we forgot who the battle was against, and we thought it was against my son. Our son, the blonde boy who broke the window. If I squeeze the life out of him, I don't have to worry <laughs> about any more broken windows. Right. And I think for a was moment was my thinking he thought for a moment that was going to happen. And then I, I stepped in, as all moms do when dads lose their brain, and I stepped in and I calmed him down and I told my son to run. Just run! Give your dad a minute! <laughs> but you know, sometimes, although it's funny, it's not in the moment. You've all been there. Wait. Don't act like you haven't. Then two years later... He did it again. He did it again. <laughs> Same window. Same window. Throwing a rock. Same son. Same son, different rock, same brother. Cost the same amount to same fix Same vehicle, different window. Yes. We explained he could have had a dirt bike for all the windows that he's broke, but, you know, we move on. But sometimes we forget that we're not in a battle against one another. In families, we've got these challenges, and the enemy strategically tries to bring up friction. In that moment, we begin to fight with one another. You know, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against our spouse. It's not against our kids. It's not against your co-workers, even though you want to choke them sometimes. It's not against your boss. It's not against the crazy psychos on the highway that you are running up on and having some road rage. And I'm like, get our bumper sticker off your car if you're going to do that, right? It's not. I know him. <laughs> he goes to our church. <laughs> I do remember this awesome story one time of um, a guy in Dallas, and he said he was driving in Dallas traffic, and he was getting quite frustrated, and this lady kind of cut him off just a little bit, and he got very frustrated, and so he flies up and cuts her off, and they come up to this, well, hold on, strategic part of the story. As he flies around, he flies her a finger that he shouldn't have. Yes. And so as he does that, they both come up, because you all get to the same place at almost the same time in crazy traffic. Traffic stopped. He comes to a traffic, yeah, it completely stops, and he looks <laughs> over. They're side by side. And the girl that he just flipped off was his Sunday, Sunday school, school teacher, teacher at church. <laughs> Was yes, like, go God, said, that's awesome. And she looked at him because she see knew on the Sunday. moment it happened. Kay. She waved and said, see you Sunday, <laughs> as they took off. Now just imagine, in our life, oftentimes we forget who this battle is really all That is an about. awesome story. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that one. All right, so as we look at this, our battle's not against flesh and blood. We've, we have made that very clear. Who's it against? What are the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, the spiritual host of wickedness? I want you to think about our military. In our military, we've got a chief who is in charge. We've got strategic guys and girls who sit in war rooms preparing the strategies for battle. We've got the actual people who go out and do battle, right? We have all of those different pieces. These four different things that you see, the principalities, they literally are the chief rulers. Brad told you earlier that one third of the angels of heaven fell out or were kicked out of heaven with Satan. These guys are now a strategic, well-trained 
army that you cannot see. They are an invisible army that every day they are strategically planning to take you and I out. Why do they want to do that? Because remember, they were kicked out of heaven and you are now promised that same hope. You're promised to get to live for all eternity where they can never, ever again be. They hate you. So then you have powers. You've got the rulers of darkness of this age, and you've got spiritual hosts of wickedness. Those four different areas are each strategic parts of the army. They are all demonic forces that are working together on a daily basis, watching you and I, listening to what we say. The Bible says that there's power of life and death in our tongue, and the enemy's waiting. His army is listening for you to speak out those words that say, I hate this. I just can't do this anymore. And guess what he'll do? He'll strategically allow you to go through another one of those same circumstances to where you're forced again in that same situation. And rather than saying, I can't do it, but God can. I thank God. I just was speaking to somebody yesterday and I was re-quoting to them Philippians 4.13 that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But if you study that out, it literally means I can do all things through Christ who infuses me with strength. It's not just like it surrounds you, it infuses you. And so as we come up against the enemy and his strategic army, we have to understand that we are infused with Christ's strength and we don't do it on our own. It's only through the power of God. So now that we know a little bit more about who the enemy is, what he looks like, let's look at his plans uh, for our attack and for our defeat. Uh, This is a very common scripture. If you've been in the faith very long, you've heard of John 10 and 10. It says this, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. And I want to stop there for just a second and talk about how the three things that Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. When you think about heaven as your home, you have a hope of eternity where you will live forever with God. Now, if you remember towards the beginning of the message, we talked about who Lucifer was in the beginning. Where did Lucifer reside? In heaven with God. That is the place where he was probably second in command over all of heaven. Arrayed in beauty and splendor and in might. And he had the leadership. And he he had it all in heaven. Now that he's been cast out of heaven, we know he hates God. Who else do you think he hates? He hates you. Why? Because when we accept Christ, when we fall into that or or are led into that real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious, our life is never the same again, and we have heaven as our home and as our hope. And because of that, we get to live in the place that he was kicked out of. And so he is extremely, extremely angry, and he hates you, and he hates God so much that he will stop at nothing to totally and completely tear you down. How does he do that? In these three ways, to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal hope of heaven as your home. Now, you're thinking, kill. How is he literally going to kill me? Does, does, does Satan have the ability to kill you? No, he doesn't have the ability to personally kill you unless God were to give him permission. We don't have time to go into that. But the fact is, he's not going to kill you physically, but he can kill you spiritually. When you look at the word in James, it talks about how sin, when it's full grown, it brings forth what? Death. Death. And we're talking about a spiritual death that will last forever and ever and ever. How many of you guys want to spend eternity in hell? Raise your hand. Good. I wanted to catch those that may have been sleeping. <laughs> hell is going to be a horrible place that you do not want to go. And, and trust me when I tell you there's going to be a lot of people who make it there who were really, really good people. And you say to yourself, how can that be, Pastor? Because the Bible makes it so clear there is one way and one way only to make it to heaven. And that is through a relationship with the one who gave his life for you on the cross. And his name is Jesus. You must have a real and life-changing relationship with him if you want to have heaven as your home. So Satan can bring you spiritual death. If you don't have that that life-changing relationship I'm talking about. By default, if you aren't for God, you're against God. And if you're against God, then you have hell to look forward to. The reason hell was even created was because God cast out Satan. It wasn't for you. When God cast out Satan and the third of the, the demons, 
or the angels that then turned to demons, he created hell for them. If you read in Revelation, we, we know that he will one day be cast there for all of eternity. But by default, if we don't choose that free gift of life, then we choose to be on Satan's side, and we know where Satan is going to spend eternity. The third thing that he wants to do is he wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your future. He wants to destroy anything and everything that is, that is connecting you and God. He hates you, and he cannot stand you. And as I said, he will stop at nothing to destroy you. But what does God want? What does Jesus want? It's the second half of that passage of Scripture in verse 10. It says, this is Jesus speaking, I have come that they, that's you and that's me, may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That's a promise to you and to me that God will give us an abundant life here on earth and also in heaven. Does that mean you're going to be rich and you're going to have a huge house and a beautiful Maserati and you're going to have everything that you want? No, it doesn't mean that. If you do, that's great. More power to you. There's nothing wrong with it. But that's not what the abundant life is all about. The abundant life is the fact that you can go through hell and back with total and complete peace and joy in the midst of your trials because you know that this is just temporary. Heaven is my home, and heaven is going to last forever. This is temporary. We're only here for a little while. Wasn't that a country song in the 90s? Only here for a little while. That's a good, that's good stuff right there. That's good stuff. We're only here for a little while. It's temporary, and then we're going to see heaven for all of eternity as the place where God is calling us to, and he has called us to have abundant life. So how do we do that? Matthew 6 and 33. She, she brought it out so, so wonderfully in, in, the, in her message this morning, Kathy, with the offering. God has called us to live that abundant life. How? By seeking him first in everything that you do. I'm telling you guys, you are in a war. There's a battle that has been waged against your life. And my question for you is, are you going to just roll over and die? Or are you going to take up arms and fight? That's the question for you this morning. You know, a lot of us don't take it seriously because it's out of sight, out of mind. You, I don't think most people realize what's really happening because we're captured in this dimension called the natural. And we can't see the supernatural. We can't see the battle that's being raged above our heads. But I'm, I'm telling you that Satan has a plan. And there is a war going on over your life right now, but you can't see it with your eyes. You see the effects of it in your life. But you really can't see exactly what's happening and who's involved. But I want to encourage you today to know that you don't need to be discouraged. You don't need to be fearful. You need to know that if you have Christ, you are not a victim. You are the victor. I hope you enjoyed watching today's video. Our desire more than anything is that as you tune in and you watch these messages, that, that your life truly is uh, inspired and that you're encouraged and you're challenged to just do life differently. And, and our desire is that God would just speak to your heart in such an amazing way that you would feel his presence and that you have been uh, encouraged to really discover life like never before. You know, maybe you heard something in today's message that just caused you to, to ponder uh, about your salvation and ask the question, you know, am I really saved? Do I really have the hope of, of having and experiencing heaven as my home. And I would just say to you that, that making that decision to follow Christ, to make him the very center of your life, is the most important decision you can ever, ever think about making. And I want to give you an opportunity right now. You might say, Pastor Brad, you know, I just, I, I realize, I've come to a point in my life where I realize that I don't have the peace and the hope and the joy that I see believers, Christians having, and I want to have that same thing. And make Christ your very best friend. Invite him into your heart. Will you pray with me right now? Father, we are just so, so in love with you and so thankful, God, that that you have given us your son, Jesus. 
and, and that you're so willing and so quick to forgive us of our shortcomings, so quick to forgive us of our mistakes, the things that we've said, the thoughts we've had, the things we've done. Uh, and and we've, we've fallen short in so many ways, God. We've sinned against you and against your word. And I just pray right now, Father God, that you would forgive me of those things that I've done. And I pray that you would make me new, just like your word says. God, I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I believe he's the King of Kings. I confess with my mouth, Lord, that, that Jesus is Lord, that he's King. And I dedicate from this moment forward that I'm going to live for him. I, I invite Jesus into my life, into my heart, into my mind, into my actions, into my attitude each and every day in every way that Christ would, would just infiltrate, infuse me with his, his character and his power and his love. And Father, I just, I thank you so much for what you're going to do in my life. God, this is a brand new day. This is the day you've made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And I just pray right now that you would help me, God, to find a church that, that is going to come around me and just support me and encourage me to, to do my, my ministry and to find my calling in you. And, uh, and I'm believing you for it today, Father God. I thank you so much, God, for what you've done in my life, never to be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, if you prayed that prayer, I'm telling you right now, your life will never be the same again. And I, I just want to encourage you to just keep Christ at the very center of your life every day. Become a person of prayer. Fall in love with God's word. Fall in love with God's house. Fall in love with God's people. And you can discover life. We'll see you next time.